Good day, dear beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. I greet you in the name of the Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I pray that God will bless you and give you His peace and His joy in your in your hearts, even amidst the crises that we may experience in different ways worldwide, but also very personal. Um, and I pray that God will give us wisdom and that He will guide us through His Word and His Spirit and tell us what to do and what is expected of us, how to react in this time. Our text for today we read from the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verse 1 to 12. Uh, I'm not going to read the text for time's sake, but I hope that you have read it already, or if you didn't, to pause the video and to do so. In just to give a little bit of background of what is happening in the text, to recall, this is where the Israelites, um, together with Moses and Aaron, comes um, to the end of the 40 years that they traveled the desert um, from the exodus out of Egypt. Um, and a time where they have learned to trust God and to have a relationship with God. But in the end, the very end, just as the 40 years comes to an end, is where they discover that they don't have any water to drink. Now, water is an essential thing uh, for anybody. We need it to live. It's, it's existential for every human being. Um, so this is a crisis. And um, the Israelites react by being rebellious. And so Moses and Aaron goes to the tent of where they meet God. And God instructs Moses to go to the rock. Now one can imagine that in the desert there are many rocks. But he specifically tells him to go to the rock. So it uh, implies that he refers to a specific rock. And I will come back to which rock that is, um, supposes, supposedly would be. And God instructs Moses to talk to the rock. Then Moses and Aaron go and Moses do not talk to the rock, but rather he hit the rock with a stick, um, which we recall he did at the previous time, um, also with a, when there was a crisis with water. Um, and the result of this, that Moses hit the rock, was that he didn't have the opportunity with Aaron to go with the Israelites into the promised land, and that they would not have that wonderful privilege. Now there's a lot of mystery around this, uh, questions that one would like to have answers for why. Um, in the first place, why? It, it kind of seems strange that the kind of uh, punishment that Moses get and Aaron, it's quite harsh and it's hard to understand why this is so important for God that uh, Moses would do exactly as he instructed. On the other hand, it's also quite um, mysterious why Moses would do so. Why, if it is quite simple to talk to the rock as God instructs, why would you then go out and hit it with a stick? To try to unravel it, and more important, to understand the relevance of this text also for us today, as we are facing uh, crisis in our time around the COVID and the lockdown and what goes with it, the economical situation um, and in various different uh, existential needs of people that we experience around us. So we are in a crisis. What and how does this text help us today and what can we discover of what God is teaching and teaching us um, to help to uh, how we should react in times such like this. 
So to try to understand the mystery and the strangeness of this um, reaction of um, Moses and of God um, takes us back to the very first verse of the text. Um, so it's verse 1, and I'm going to read it for us. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried, and there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. Now, in this translation, um, it doesn't actually say and, but in the Hebrew text, the two things, verse 1 and 2, is connected with a and, um, which it, it, it shows us that there is a link between these two ideas, the fact that Miriam has died and the fact that there was no more water. All of a sudden, after 40 years in the desert, all of a sudden there's no more water. And it's connected with the death of Miriam. Now to try to understand why, um, I'd like to show you how Miriam is woven and connected um, into the, the journey that they have, and especially at terrible times and critical times um, with uh, the need for water. So the natural question is, how is Miriam connected to the crisis with the water, the fact that the water dried up? Um, and to show that, we need to go back into the other um, times when the Israelites had this water crisis as well. But before we do so, I'd like to show you um, how her name, although not necessarily um, being implied pertinent, um, but more subtle in the texts, to, is to understand that the original Hebrew um, text of the Hebrew Bible was written only with consonants. It's almost like how the teenagers would spell when they WhatsApp nowadays, um, leaving out the vowels, and surprisingly how one can follow what they're trying to say if you know the language well. But the problem is if you don't, if you aren't that comfortable with a language, then it becomes harder to understand exactly what is written if there's only the consonants. The original Hebrew Bible um, text, the way they read, had written, was only to write the, the consonants. But eventually they discovered or realized that other people also uh, want to read this text and they wouldn't necessarily be so comfortable and knowledgeable about the Hebrew uh, context and language. So at the time they asked the Masoretes to fill in vowels for the words so that one can pronounce it and for one to understand it for different um, can you say combinations of the consonants could have different meanings um, if you pronounce it differently if you put different vowels to the consonants then it has different meanings and so the the consonants of the name of Miriam um, which is an in our language a M a R a J and another M so if it's only those four consonants and if you put different vowels with it, it has different meanings. So the first um, combination with vowels of understanding with, of this name would have the meaning of bitterness. And another combination would have the meaning of to lift up one's hand. And then there's a third, third combination or probability um, if you don't, do not have the vowels, and that is 
that of rebellion. And if you look at the three contexts where the Israelites had the water crisis, you notice that but all three of these meanings is interwoven into the text. In the first case, and this is when the Israelites were only three days in the desert after the crossing of the Red Sea, um, and one can imagine and one can expect that they would run out of water in the desert. And uh, there God shows them an oasis. But the water of the oasis was bitter. Notice this word bitter for the consonant combination is the same of the word Miriam. And one would almost, um, if you just read the text, uh, notice and ask, Wait, wait, what is, is it referring to Miriam or is it referring to bitterness? Because from the context, one must um, uh, conclude which meaning uh, the word will take. So obviously, it is about bitterness, for the water was bitter. And uh, then God called Moses to throw in a stick and after that the water became sweet and drinkable and uh, the problem was solved. The second crisis is only a few days later and one would also expect that after having learned the lesson that they're in a desert they probably made sure that their cans were filled and they had enough water whatever they could have to fill it of, with water. But eventually, even that would dry up. And again, they have the crisis of not having the existential uh, um, need for, for water. And uh, this time, the Israelites became cross and very aggressive, almost tear against Moses. And so God instructed Moses to pick up a stick and to hit a rock with it. And then very subtly um, it is described how Moses picked up his hand. And there's another um, consonant uh, combination of the word of the name of Miriam is to pick up his hand. And this time he hits the rock with a stick. And uh, there came fresh water from that and the problem was solved. And then 40 years go by before there's another water crisis. And the reason for that is that they never went too far off from this well. That whenever there was a water need, they could send somebody to get water from Miriam's well. And then all of a sudden we read that Miriam dies and the well with it dries up. There was no more water running from the well. And um, the Israelites be again became aggressive and rebellion and Moses would answer them you rebellious group. Um, and there we see the third combination, the, um, the way that the name of Miriam is interwoven within the text. The first one, we had, had the bitterness, the bitter water. The second one was the picking of, the, uh, of his hand. And the third one is the word of rebellion. And all three of these refer to a reaction um, towards a crisis. Um, you can either be bitter about crisis or and the other one is that you can be aggressive because uh, raising your hand is, is an expression of aggression and the last one is plainly being rebellious. Um, so that is the normal kind of within crisis, the way people react. But to understand more fully the, the larger context of Miriam's connection with, with faith and with water, 
we need to go back to the very beginning with the uh, where Moses, her brother, was born. And at that time, of course, we under remember that the Pharaoh has um, killed, uh, has ordered that all the baby boys were killed and thrown into the Nile. So Moses' mother, we know, uh, made a basket and she laid Moses within it and she laid the the basket with Moses in it, in the Nile, between the reeds. And uh, at that stage, Moses' mother would probably say, this is it. This is all I can do and I can only hope and kei sera, sera, what will be, will be, let it be. And there's nothing more I can do. He's on the water. But there's another character that springs up at that stage and that is that is his um, his little sister Miriam between the reeds and then we read that she stood up and watched stood up and watched because although nobody could see the future nobody could make any more plans to have any outcome it was a situation that was there was in that they could not foresee any more plans to do. But Miriam was the one standing between the roots, reeds and watching. It's almost as if she said, I don't know anymore. I don't have any more answers, but I know that and I'm standing and I'm watching because God, the God of the universe, the God of heaven and earth is in control and he has a plan um, and we trust in him. So standing and watching is almost watching what is God going to do. Although I don't have any more plans, um, I trust that God will have a plan. And then she is the one who intervenes also with the Pharaoh's daughter who sees him, who sees Moses and who um, takes him out of the water. And then uh, a few years later, is when after God has called Moses, he's an adult now, and um, ordered him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, and the Pharaoh would cave in after the plagues, and so they would on their way, and they reached the Red Sea, and. In the meanwhile, the Pharaoh changed his mind and sent his army um, behind them. So they were cornered. So in a crisis, in a situation where they could not see any which way to go. There was nowhere to go. Um, and at that stage, Moses would stand up and he would say to the Israelites, Stand up and watch. So the same thing is playing out as with the birth of, of Moses is this situation of standing when you don't have any more plans to stand up and watch at what God is going to do. Because when we don't have any more God, the King of the universe, the Lord of Lords is in control. And then God does the miracle of um, opening the sea before them. And as they move through the sea, we read that Miriam was praising the Lord and dancing and singing. And it's almost as if she understood that it was the same thing playing out, but in a much larger scale. It's not one person anymore uh, that's being saved, but a whole um, group of the Israelites um, and it's not one person against them all it's a whole army and it's not a small body of water that's in their way but a whole sea in front of them um, but still it is the faith that they that uh, of Miriam that um, to trust in God when there's no other way so when can I see there's a, a connection and interwovenness of Miriam throughout the Exodus and especially in the desert. 
And one could would ask, so what happens in this very last scene, this last crisis, when Miriam dies and the water dries up and Moses takes a stick after God told him to talk to the rock, to hit it. Um, and it's understandable almost that Moses at such a time of, with a lot of pressure from the Israelites um, because they were thirsty, it was a, a life or death situation that after um, receiving orders from God to fall back on what he knows worked in the past. The previous time God ordered him to pick up a stick and to hit the rock. And that worked. So in crisis one tends to fall back on what worked. But God, um, what God is actually trying to say is that every situation, although it may look very much the same, although the crisis is described as the same, it doesn't mean that you can simply repeat your the last success story. What, what worked last time may not happen the next time. And each time we need to come to God and listen to God and do exactly what God instructs us to do. So this is a couple of things, five things actually, that from this text I think is very, very re relevant for us today, also in our crisis. Uh, although it's not a water crisis, although we also know that in the small Karoo there's still places that are very dry and uh, we pray for that as well. But worldwide we also have the uh, crisis of the uh, epidemic of the COVID and the lockdown and everything of how that works out and plays out and um, also existentially with people's works and the jobs and um, in so many areas that this creates a crisis in the world. Um, and when we stand here we, and not having any more answers, human answers and outcomes and plans, when that all dries up, what do we do? And we learn from this text. The first thing, thing is what Miriam stood for and that was to stand up and watch with hope with an expectation to know that although we don't have all the answers or any more answers that there is a god of heaven and earth a lord of lords who is in control and to trust him and the second idea is from this text is to be um obedient to God in the new situation to listen to what he tells us to do now and not to fall back on what may have worked in previous times of crises but to to ask God to be with us now to lead us and to tell us to um, to listen to God's voice um, the fourth thing is I believe that God warns Moses and warns us in times like this not to be superstitious about things. Um, it was very close and it's almost as if Moses put more trust in the stick that God gave him to hit the rock with. It's almost as if he thought God gave him a want and that he is like a sorcerer and that with the right formulation and words that he can recreate a certain um, outcome every time with the same thing. But God is not uh, giving his people uh, a skill of sorcery at all. It is about obedience and listening to God's instruction. And the last idea that I'd like to share is that there comes a time 
when we um, need to embody and own and make faith our own. Maybe you have experienced this as well as maybe having a very religious father or mother or grandparents um, who prayed for you and who guided you and who also always encouraged you to be faithful. And the, the, when they pass away, you have the experience of what now? Who is going to pray for me now? Who is going to guide me in my faith and my walk with God now? But there comes a time when you need to um, make your faith habits your own and not rely on others. And I believe that this is this passage shows that not only Moses, but also the, the Israelites, um, all of them, put their trust in Miriam to guide them in their faith. But now Miriam was, has died. And it was time for them to own it for themselves, to have faithful habits. And immediately, Moses fails in this. Now, I also would like to um, make the connection to the New Testament, of course. Um, in the New Testament, we get the idea where Jesus... Um, proclaims that I am the, the water, the living water, and whoever comes to me it will be like a, a well uh, that will springs up from within, a living water um, coming from, from inside of us. And what a wonderful idea that Jesus is this well, as Miriam's well was there for 40 years for the, for the Israelites. So Jesus, and when we have Jesus in our lives, in our hearts, in our faith, that it is a constant um, source of life and living water. And then we also get the idea where, and this we sing often, in, especially in the old hymn, um, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. To, to think of where Jesus hung on the cross and he was beaten, that the rock was cleft for us. But that was a once-off thing. Jesus, uh, the rock was cleft only that once. And we needn't um, do that time and again whenever we get in a crisis situation to say, God, you must do something, you must die, die for us or you must uh, do something again. Jesus did it once. And now he asks us, informs us to talk to the rock. We don't need him to be cleft again. We need to talk to the rock, to Jesus. And he will listen. It's a, it's a new reality. The rock is already broken open and the living water is already flowing from it. And we can already receive life-giving fresh water from this rock, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Brothers and sisters, I am sure that we can all see how this text is relevant to us today. Um, in our context, in the crisis that we face whenever in different situations where, where we don't see any outcome and have no more plans and when we are uh, tempted to fall back on experience but God is calling us to trust Him, to stand up and to watch what He is doing but that we don't need God to hit the rock um, again for God to listen, to open up the source. The source is open for the rock has been cleft already. We need to talk to God um, and intervene and listen exactly and to be uh, obedient to the letter to how God instructs us today for what we need to do. Um, I invite you to pray with me. 
Thank you, Jesus, Rock of Ages, who was cleft for us. Lord, that we can know this and that this is um, a reality that is in the past. It already happened. And that you invite us now, Lord, that whenever we come in situations again, when we feel trapped and cornered into a, a problematic area, and we don't see the outcome. We don't have any more plans. Lord, that we may come to you and may ask you, we may talk to you. And to know that you do listen and you hear what we, uh, what we say and what we ask from you. And Lord, therefore we ask and we pray that you will um, help us not to be superstitious or to fall back on our previous experiences of what worked in the past, but to look forward and to trust you and to stand up and to watch what you are doing at this time, in our midst, in our lives, in the playing out of the history of humankind and of the world. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Jesus, that this rock, that you have been cleft for us. And as Peter um, confessed when you asked him who you are, who he thinks you are, or believes you are to reply with you are the son of God you are the Messiah you are the Christ and you replied Lord that on this rock you will build your church and this rock Lord is not Peter in himself we know but in the confession of faith of confession to stand up and to watch and to trust in you you are the Son of God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother and sister, I pray that um, we will make this our own and not rely on others' faith, but as a church to own our confession, um, our belief in who Jesus is, and not that the rock needs to be cleft again, but to talk to God to talk to the rock, to Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And therefore I greet you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.